Hey everyone, I'm Abby from Abby's Kitchen. Welcome back to our series, Enlightened by Intuitive Eating. In our last video, we discussed principle number eight of intuitive eating, respect your body. So if you haven't watched that video yet, definitely go check it out right here and then come back to watch this one. Now, before we get started, I want to flag that this content may not be for all of my viewers. So feel free to take and leave what you find valuable. I also want to remind you to check out Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch's book, which I've linked below. And a big thank you to intuitive eating dietitian Alyssa Rumsey for reviewing this content. I will leave her contact in the description below so that you can reach out for any one-on-one -on -one consults. Now let's get to our reader question. And baby is kicking. Dear Abby, if my set point has gone up from dieting, is it possible for it to come back down from intuitive eating? That is a really good question. For those of you who don't know, set point theory suggests that the body works to maintain a predetermined weight range through regulation of metabolism. Essentially, the body will slow the metabolism down when underfed and increase the metabolism when overfed to minimize large changes in one's weight. Your body is really trying to keep you alive, so it will put in various mechanisms to try to prevent a person from losing weight well below their set point weight range. This is exactly why most people who lose weight will end up regaining that weight over time your body will fight really freaking hard to get back to where it's most comfortable. For a lot of people, this set point weight range is not in the normal BMI range. Diversity in body sizes is normal, just like there are diversity in heights or shoe size. So not everyone's set point is going to be in that normal BMI range and that's okay. Over time, it is possible that dieting may cause your set point weight range to increase. When people start working on intuitive eating and reconnecting with their body's internal cue system, over time, your body does tend to naturally settle into a weight range that is right for you. But it's impossible to know what that weight range is. I mean, you don't know that and I don't know that. Some people lose weight during this process of intuitive eating while others stay the same and others gain. Also, our weight is not static over time. It, it really does ebb and flow depending on our situation, our life stage, and our environment. This is why I encourage you to try to put your weight and your set point range on the back burner as you go through these exercises. We don't know what your body is going to do. All we can do is work towards reconnecting to your body's cues, honoring those cues and nourishing and taking care of your body as best as you can, no matter what weight you are at. Instead of focusing on the number on the scale or the size of your pants, pay attention to how you feel, both physically and emotionally. When your body is at its healthiest, you'll know because you'll probably feel more energized. You might sleep better, your mood will be improved, and overall, you'll just feel better. So if you want more information about set point theory, check out my video on Stephanie Buttermore, where I dive into this in more detail. Now in this video, we'll be discussing principle number nine, exercise, feel the difference. Right away, I want to ask you a question. What does exercise mean to you? What is your attitude towards it? Is it a chore? Is it a burden? Do you genuinely enjoy it? For a lot of people, Exercise isn't something that they do for fun. It's, it's something that they feel that they have to do. It's been deeply ingrained in us since we were little kids and all of our early experiences with exercise have really shaped how we feel about it today. Honestly, when I was in elementary school, it seemed like gym class was designed to make some people feel superior and others feel like the odd ones out. I was definitely the lanky, awkward, not sporty kid who was always picked last for teams. Or remember having to run laps or do suicides or push-ups as a form of punishment? Do you think that these people are fond of running nowadays? Probably not. I would say also as adults, a lot of us don't enjoy movement because we're not exercising out of love for our body, but we're exercising out of a desire to change it. And in a lot of cases, we don't enjoy it because we're just so motivated in the beginning by our body goals that we totally overdo it. We go from not working out to doing hour long boot camps five days a week until we injure ourselves or become so miserable that we throw in the towel. And if we don't see any change in our body, we may get discouraged and just stop. The thing is when most people start a weight loss driven exercise regime, they also start a diet at the same time. 
The problem with that is that the combination of high exercise output and low caloric intake tends to leave your fuel tank pretty low. The result? You're more susceptible to injuries and so fatigued, there's no chance that you're going to enjoy it. I hate to break it to you, but just like dieting, Exercise does not result in weight loss for the majority of people. For one, a 2014 review of the literature found that most exercise programs lead to only modest weight loss of about two kilograms or 4.4 pounds, which isn't a drastic amount. What's more, many people ended up regaining a lot of that weight back, just like we see with dieting by restricting food intake. The review found that while you may see a little modest weight loss in the short term from exercise, this is about three times greater than in the long term. In fact, the amount of exercise energy expenditure had no correlation with weight loss in the long term. This may be because our body has a lot of compensatory mechanisms in place to prevent you from losing weight. Excessively exercising can cause your body to shift towards a state of survival and fight to reduce weight loss by increasing your hunger and making you feel more tired. Therefore, you may just end up eating more food and moving less. For example, you might not take the stairs as often, maybe you don't do your daily chores, etc. Another thing to consider is that every person has a different body and each person responds to exercise differently. We all have different metabolisms that are influenced by our age, sex, fat mass, aerobic capacity, insulin sensitivity, and fat oxidation during exercise. What's more, these variables also influence how our body responds to weight loss and the mechanisms it puts in place to prevent it, such as an increased hedonistic value of high calorie foods. Finally, up to 50% of people who join fitness or exercise programs drop out in the first six months to a year. Therefore, it puts into question how sustainable relying on exercise for long-term weight loss really is. Now, just to show you that you don't have to have exercise every single day to reap the health benefits outside of weight, there was a study that looked at frequency of exercise and its effect on weight and heart health. In the study, participants were put into two groups, high frequency activity and low frequency activity. For the high frequency activity group, they were instructed to exercise for about 50 minutes per day, six times a week. For the low frequency activity group, they were instructed to exercise for 100 minutes per day, three times a week. So after 24 weeks, both groups found a decrease in anthropometric measurements and significant improvements in heart health. Obviously, this is still a lot of exercise for both groups, and I get that this may not be sustainable for most people at all, but the point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't exactly necessarily have to be extreme and little acts of activity like walking to work or taking the stairs can actually add up. Another crucial point is that most research studies have participants doing extreme amounts of exercise, like 60 minutes plus of exercise per day. In fact, the American College of Sports Medicine and American Diabetes Association have said recommended levels of physical activity may help produce weight loss. However, up to 60 minutes a day may be required when relying on exercise alone for weight loss. Since the majority of people fail to meet the 150 minutes of exercise per week recommendation, it's very unlikely that most people can sustainably add this much exercise to their daily life. I'm just saying that relying on it for weight loss is maybe even more dismal than relying on diet for weight loss. For most people, it doesn't work in the long term. Now, while exercise may not actually be a really great weight loss tool, it is truly so good for our health. So what are the legitimate benefits of exercise? Number one, increased physical strength. One obvious benefit is improved physical strength and muscle building, but it's not all for aesthetics. Having strength is important for performing daily tasks, and it sure feels awesome when you can say, no, I got it, when somebody needs help. What's more, lean muscle mass has been shown to improve insulin signaling, which may help reduce the risk of metabolic disease. Number two, increased bone strength. A lot of people focus on muscle building when it comes to weight bearing exercise, but it also plays a really key role in bone health as well. Under resistance training or weight bearing exercise, the bones get stressed, which allows bones to break down and rebuild bones stronger. This process is called osteogenesis. 
To start osteogenesis, some type of mechanical load is required, which is usually weights or something heavy, ideally with the movement repeated at a steady rate over time. Now, you may be wondering if it's really that important at a young age, since you're probably not going to be getting osteoporosis anytime soon. But weight-bearing exercise is important at any age. When we're young, it's about prevention and bone banking. And lifting weights is a great way to keep your bones strong to prevent osteoporosis down the road. When we're older, research has still shown that lifting weights can reduce your risk of osteoporosis. So pick up something heavy and put it back down. Now, number three is improved heart health. Exercise is known for its effects on lowering blood pressure and strengthening the heart muscle. Furthermore, it's also been shown to improve levels of HDL or our healthy cholesterol. This is ultimately really important for keeping our heart healthy and decreasing the amount of stress that you put on it. Number four is improved lung health. So our heart and lungs go hand in hand. The less stress that we put on our heart equals less stress on our lungs and vice versa. As well, regular exercise can really improve our aerobic performance. You'll notice that as you exercise more regularly, you aren't out of breath quite as quickly. Now number five is lowering the risk of chronic disease. So exercise has been shown to significantly lower our risk of diseases like heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, certain types of cancer, etc. Number six is improved satiety cues and appetite regulation. Research has actually shown that exercise can play a role in regulating appetite through changes in our hunger hormones. That is pretty cool. Number seven, better cognitive function. So exercise has been widely shown to have benefits for our brain health. In fact, it's been shown to increase gray matter in the brain, improve neuroplasticity, which is our brain's ability to learn and adapt through life, as well as to lower the risk of neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and dementia. Number eight is better sleep. You all know I need this. But research suggests that engaging in regular movement may help promote better sleep. Just keep in mind that exercising too close to bed may actually keep you up. So try to exercise at least two hours before bed or earlier. Number nine is mental health. This is last but definitely not least because exercise can have a profound effect on our mental health. And I'd say this is one of the main reasons that I really encourage people to get moving. First, exercise helps to lower cortisol levels in the body that are caused by chronic stress. If we have too high cortisol in the body, this can ultimately lead to insulin resistance, inflammation, and potentially lead to the development of other chronic diseases. Second, exercise allows for the release of feel-good hormones like norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin, which can ultimately help improve our mood. In fact, research has shown that exercise may be a really effective treatment in lowering depression, especially when combined with other treatments like therapy, medications, etc. Finally, exercise is an opportunity to get your mind off life's problems. It's not meant as an escape, but a short respite from the stresses of our daily life. Now, despite all of its benefits, I do fully appreciate that getting into an exercise regime is not as simple as motivation or willpower like you'll hear some fitness influencers say. In some cases, it takes a long time to undo the damage that punishing exercise has done to us. It may take us a while to build up confidence and convince ourselves that we are worthy and capable of it. But it's important to maybe navigate some of the barriers that may be holding you back and to reestablish your relationship with moving your body. Here are some key things that you can do to help. Number one, focus on how it feels. It may sound strange, but exercise is actually supposed to feel good. Yes, exercise is supposed to be fun and exciting, not pure torture. So first, it's really important that you find movement that is actually enjoyable to you. Some people love to run miles, others want to lift weights, and others still prefer more low impact activities like yoga or Pilates. When you find something that you love doing, exercise becomes enjoyable and something that you actually look forward to. Next, it's time to shift your focus from calorie burning to how exercise makes you feel both mentally and physically. I know it's tempting to look at the treadmill or your fitness tracker to see how many calories you burned or how many steps you've taken, but it does tend to take away from the enjoyment of exercise and starts becoming a competition again. 
Also, these calorie trackers do not take into consideration your personal biology, so they are not even accurate to begin with. I did a whole video on why I broke up with my Fitbit if you want to watch it right here. But instead, I want you to focus on the following factors both before and after you start exercising again. Number one is stress. How are your stress levels? Are you able to handle stressful situations better? Are you less edgy? Sleep. How are you sleeping? Exercise and sleep go hand in hand. I mean, you'll likely notice that you're sleeping better as a result of moving more. A sense of well-being. What is your outlook on life like? Are you more positive? Energy levels. Do you feel more energized and alert? On days that you exercise, do you feel like you can be more focused and ready to take on the day? Sense of empowerment. Do you feel more confidence in yourself and your abilities to perform tasks? Now, if you decide to take a break for exercise, I want you to first ask yourself some of these questions. It's okay if you're feeling stressed or you aren't sleeping well. That's, that's totally normal and will actually help you see the difference exercise might be able to make. When you introduce exercise again, I want you to continue asking yourself these questions. Changes may not happen overnight, but you'll probably notice a gradual increase in energy and your confidence, lower stress, and better sleep. And with those positive changes, you may actually become more motivated to continue exercising regularly because of how good it makes you feel. Now, I also want you to separate exercise from weight loss. As I mentioned earlier, people commonly start exercising to lose weight and change their body. But like I said, Exercise is not even a great contributor to weight loss. And if your only goal is to lose weight, you're probably going to lose motivation to exercise pretty quickly when the number on the scale doesn't budge. Especially because if and when exercise does change your body, it may be in the form of building muscle, which can negate any weight loss on the scale. As well, I don't like linking exercise and weight loss together because it really diminishes the important benefits of exercise that have absolutely nothing to do with weight or the size of your body. By shifting your focus to promoting your health and quality of life, exercise gains a whole new meaning. It's really time to focus on taking care of yourself, both physically and mentally. Now, if you have a history of diet mentality, it's likely that at some point you've developed some do not exercise traps that have prevented you from enjoying exercise like it's meant to be enjoyed. So let's talk about those. The not worth it trap. For a lot of people, unless you are completely dripping in sweat and can barely breathe, your exercise didn't count. Unless you exercise for over an hour, you didn't do enough or you only exercise twice a week instead of five, so why bother? This type of talk has been fed to us by the diet industry, and unfortunately, a lot of online influencers as well. Let's make something very clear. All movement is good movement. When we stop focusing on the calories, the pounds, minutes, steps, or the number of sweat droplets pouring off of our forehead, we become liberated to move in ways that actually serve us. Instead, a quick walk during your lunch break or taking the stairs can be appreciated for what it is, movement that feels good. Now, if you really need numbers, consider this. Let's say that you were to walk for 15 minutes during your lunch break three times a week. You mowed the lawn 20 minutes and you took the stairs twice per day and it takes five minutes each time. In that week, that's 115 minutes of aerobic exercise. These simple tasks can really add up over time and walking has been linked to tremendous health benefits too. Yes, it's important to get your heart rate going, but all those other forms of movement that you get throughout the week matter a lot too. Next is the no time trap. Look, we're all busy. In fact, I think we're too busy as a society. But since that's not changing anytime soon, it's time that we made exercise a priority and included it into our schedule. One of the most impactful things is to actually stop saying exercise and instead to say movement. When we say exercise, we tend to go back to the idea of this being a large, time-consuming task that has to occur in a gym. Instead, movement is all-encompassing and involves simply just moving your body. Whether it's actually going to a gym, going for a daily walk, or just taking standing breaks at work, you're adding healthy movement to your life. 
And if you still find that you're struggling to find time for movement, it may be time to evaluate your priorities and your schedule. You may be just taking on way more than you can handle. And trust me, as a self-employed mom with another on the way, I can relate to feeling overwhelmed and just lacking time. If you're sacrificing your health for work or other things, I want you to think about if it's actually worth it. No, I'm not saying quit your job. No, I'm not saying leave your house in complete disarray. No, I'm not saying you can't spend time with your kids, but perhaps a conversation with your boss about your workload is in order, or maybe asking your partner to kind of step up with the family and household responsibilities will actually help. Another helpful but not always realistic option is paying for a personal trainer or signing up for a workout class. As soon as money gets involved, it does immediately become a priority on pretty much anyone's schedule. Skipping a session means wasted money, which means you're more likely to make that movement a priority. Yes, I realize that this is not an option for everyone financially, but if you're able to, I do find it can be really helpful. Another more financially feasible option is if you're struggling to find time to get moving, find a workout buddy. Let's say you meet up with your friend once a week for coffee to catch up. Why not ask your friend if they'd be interested in getting a coffee to go and going for a walk around the neighborhood? Again, any movement is good movement. Next, we wanna make exercise fun. Exercise nowadays is positioned on social media as all heavy gym sessions in tight gym clothing. But exercise can be anything that you want it to be. I mean, it doesn't even have to take place in a gym. First things first, the number one way that movement stops becoming fun is when you get injured. So be sure to be careful when starting any exercise regime by speaking with your doctor first and make sure that the activities that you're taking part in are not hurting you or putting your health at risk in any way. So here are some examples of ways to have fun and move your body at the same time. Join a rec league. So in most towns or cities, your local rec center will probably have sports activities that you can join often for free. So soccer, volleyball, tennis, racquetball, basketball, swimming, you name it. There, there really is something for everyone. And there are so many leagues out there that are welcoming beginners of all ages. Don't do the same thing every single day. You don't have to just go to the gym to be healthy. So maybe one day you play soccer with your kids, the next day you go for a walk with your partner, the day after that you do some yoga at home in the backyard. Point being, by adding variety to your exercise regime, you're less likely to be bored. Do some at-home workouts. I don't know why there's such a stigma against at-home workouts. I mean, they are an excellent way to stay active without having to pay a fortune for a gym membership or even having to haul your to the gym. After COVID-19 hit and being stuck at home for so long, I grew to really love my online workouts. And thanks to YouTube and Instagram, there are a ton of free exercise videos available for you to try at any stage. Plus, many of the videos use just your body weight or a couple free weights, meaning you do not have to spend a fortune to be active. Another idea is to listen to podcasts. I absolutely love podcasts. And fortunately, many of them are around 30 to 60 minutes in length. So save up some podcasts that you've been wanting to listen to and go for a walk. Next, we want to make exercise easier. So if you're finding it hard to find time to work out, a really useful tip is to prepare ahead of time. Schedule time out of your day for movement and treat it as if it was an appointment with somebody else, even if you're all by yourself. Have your gym clothes out and ready to go the night before. Put your gym shoes into a work bag for exercise after work. Find ways to make exercise less of a hassle and more convenient in your life. Next, be comfortable. Look, I am all for a cute pair of yoga pants, but not necessarily at the expense of a hard workout. I feel like gym culture has created this expectation that gym attire involves a full face of makeup and tight pants and a sports bra. And if that's you, great, that is totally fine. You do you. But if that makes you uncomfortable, don't feel like you need to conform to society's expectations. Your clothes do not determine your workout. And you don't need to take a workout selfie in the gym mirror either. I mean, I definitely do not do that. Having said that, be sure that you have proper shoes which can help prevent injury and ensure that you're putting less strain on your joints. And find clothing that fits well, makes you feel comfortable, and is made with a breathable material. Working out is not fun when your underwear is like glued into your crotch with sweat. So yeah, make comfort a priority. Next, we want to make sure to stretch. 
many people get injured because they don't warm up properly. I mean, for the first five minutes of any workout, it is important to do some light movement and dynamic stretching to warm your muscles up. Again, there are a ton of awesome YouTube videos out there that can really help you out. Stretching is also important for keeping your tendons flexible, which is especially important as we age. If your tendons get tight, you're definitely more likely to get injured. It also may be worth your while to add some yoga into your routine once or twice a week, which can keep your muscles and tendons flexible, increase strength, and lower stress. Next, remember to go beyond physical fitness and aesthetics. I want you to focus on how movement makes you feel. Enjoy immediate benefits like improved mood, increased heart rate, and a sense of accomplishment. And also enjoy the fact that you're exercising for your health and well-being. If exercise is consuming your life, I want you to remember that more is not always better. Our body actually needs time to heal. So here are some red flags of exercise abuse. An unwillingness to stop, even if you're sick or injured. Feeling guilty if you miss a workout. You may have trouble sleeping. This is often a sign that you're overtraining. You're using exercise to compensate for overeating. So for example, running on the treadmill for an hour to burn off that cupcake that you ate. You're feeling afraid that you'll gain weight if you miss one workout or one week of working out, etc. If any of these red flags sound like you in your life, you may want to get a little bit of support to improve your relationship with exercise. Next, you want to schedule in rest days. So rest is arguably more important than the exercise itself. If you're overworking your body, you're not going to give it time to refuel and to heal. Remember that you're breaking down your muscles and your bones when you exercise. So you actually need a lot of time to allow for your muscles and bones to rebuild and get stronger. If not, you're just constantly breaking them down, which does way more harm than actual good. And if you miss a workout, it's no big deal. Just like one workout won't transform your health or your body, missing a workout will not ruin it either. If you ever struggle with this, I want you to tell yourself, I can always exercise tomorrow. This takes away the all or nothing mentality that I think a lot of people have when it comes to exercise and also with food. So if you take anything away from this video, I want you to remember that sometimes taking care of yourself means not exercising. If you're exhausted and your body is telling you it's tired, that is a sign to listen to it and to take the day off. Once you've rested, you can resume exercise with more energy and greater enjoyment. So for your homework this week, I want you to write down three different things that you enjoy about exercise that have nothing to do with weight loss. By continuously reminding yourself of all the benefits of movement, you can start to shift the narrative of exercise towards overall health and happiness rather than a negative punishing experience. I want you to work on these steps throughout your intuitive eating journey and stay tuned for our next video on principle number 10, honor your health with gentle nutrition. Of course, if you like this video, don't forget to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below about any questions that you might have about intuitive eating so I can answer them in an upcoming video. Don't forget to subscribe to this video and ring that little bell so that you don't miss a single video. And I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.